correction. Now, we are currently in a series in the book of Exodus. All right, I, I think it's going to take us about 10 sermons. There's a lot happening here. We're not going line by line like we usually do. We're taking huge chunks of the book of Exodus and, and trying to get some, some important themes here, trying to pick up on them and then uh, hoping that they would reveal much of God uh, and then how we are to respond to Him. All right, So we're in the book of Exodus. We are in part two. So we started... Last week, we kicked it off last week, and, and I said this last week, uh, that if you have a Bible, I encourage you to bring it. Uh, if you take notes, I encourage you uh, to do so in this time. If you don't take notes, this might be a good time to begin to do so, because uh, we're not going line by line. I'm going to be jumping uh, from uh, verse to verse and maybe chapter to chapter, uh, connecting as much as I can, wanting to reveal to you what this book is about, because it reveals to us who God is is. All right. So, so I want you to take notes. Uh, there's a lot of things that I won't be able to unpack. Um, and so here's what we're doing in this series, throughout this series, uh, is what we're going to do is we're going to, every kind of two to three sermons, uh, we're going to gather a couple of questions, uh, and then we're going to try to answer them uh, through this Q&A thing that we're looking to do, right? We're going to uh, record it. Uh, we'll be able to put it up on YouTube. And so uh, because we're wanting to do that, we're asking that you send your questions. There'll be things that I'm not going to be able to unpack, like I said, right? But you might have a question around that. So feel free to send your questions through to Exodus at rootedfellowship.com, all right? Exodus at rootedfellowship.com. You should have received an email about this. If you didn't, uh, again, speak to the folks at the back with the red lanyards. Gosh, I talk so much about you guys. Uh, you guys do amazing work. Love you guys. Um, so, so speak to them, uh, but send your questions to us, uh, and what we'll do is we're going to unpack those. We're going to categorize them and try to answer them as best as we can, uh, and that will uh, be a lot longer than... Uh, what I would be able to do on a Sunday uh, morning, all right? So uh, everybody understand that? Everybody good with that? Exodus at rootedfellowship.com. Uh, but this morning, we are jumping into Exodus part two. Now, last week, we saw uh, that God is a faithful God. Uh, he is a God of covenant. He is a promise-keeping God. What He says, He will and so that's what he's saying uh, to uh, the Israelites. That's what he's saying to us, right? So we saw that, and if you missed it, uh, I'd encourage you to go uh, and pick up on that sermon. And so we're going to see uh, similar things today, uh, but again, we're going to try to pick up some other themes of what's going on in the book of Exodus, what that is saying about who God is and what that means for us today. Before we jump in, permit me to pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you uh, that these words may be ancient words, but they are not dead words. They are living and active. And so, Lord, I pray uh, that as we unpack your word, that it would meet us where we are. Lord, would you open up hearts? Would you engage us? My prayer is that folks uh, would leave here different. They would leave here changed. They would leave here transformed by the power of your hand. Lord, I pray against the evil one whose desires are to steal, kill, and destroy. I ask that you would come and give life just as you have promised. Lord, would you stand in my body, think through my mind, speak through my vocal cords, those things you'd have us know, say, and do. We have a lot to get to, God. But I know that as you lead, we will follow. Father, we love you. We praise you. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so last week we ended with uh, uh, Moses uh, fleeing. Uh, he's a fugitive on the run, so he, he flees uh, from Egypt because uh, he's uh, just killed a man, and, uh, and he finds himself uh, in the desert in Midian, and uh, he meets some ladies, and he helps them out. Uh, then he ends up marrying uh, one of these ladies who happens to be Jethro's, one of Jethro's daughters. Um, and so now he is a shepherd, right? That's where uh, we pick up the story in Exodus 3, and, and we'll see in a moment that he's been doing this for a while, right? He's been doing it for a while. So let me read to you Exodus chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Meanwhile, Moses was shepherding the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led the flock to a far side of the wilderness and came 
to Horeb, the mountain of God. Now let's talk a little bit about this mountain. It's not just any mountain. It might have been for Moses, uh, just another mountain where he would bring his father-in-law's flock. Maybe he had a favorite resting spot at the foot of the mountain. He would sit there and probably think about his life. For him, it had probably become just another location. But not for God. See, chapter 3 opens up, like I said, with Moses at the foot of Horeb, the mountain of God. Now, Mount Horeb, also called Mount Sinai, is one of a number of mountains amongst the range in the Sinai Peninsula. This would later become the mountain that Moses uh, would lead the Israelites to camp at. We see this in Exodus chapter 19, where he would give the people of God the law of God. And so this is a significant mountain, not just another mountain. It's been 40 years since Moses left Egypt. Moses is now 80 years old here. He spent 40 years growing uh, into a well-educated, accomplished Egyptian. That was his life previously. He spent 40 years doing so, and now has spent equally as much time being trained as a shepherd, learning to care for sheep. As a prince, remember he had been adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. And so as a prince, I doubt Moses ever imagined his life as a shepherd. But God uses all our experiences. God uses all our professions. God uses all our circumstances to to shape our character and to prepare us for the mission that he has called us to. I said this last week, that we should not waste our suffering. Hear me this week, don't waste your seasons. Don't. See, for many of us, we go, here's where I want to be. Or or, here's where I believe God wants me to be. Here's where he's leading me to. And so what you do with the current is you go, it just doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. But don't do that. God doesn't waste anything. He uses it all. He uses it all. So don't waste your seasons. Ask the question, God, what are you doing with me now? I know that that this is where I'd like to be. I I believe this is where you want to lead me, but, but what are you doing with me now? Verse two, then the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire within a bush. As Moses looked, he saw that the bush was on fire, but it was not consumed. So Moses thought, I must go over and look at this remarkable sight. Why isn't the bush burning up? When the Lord saw that he had gone over to look, God called out to him from the bush, Moses, Moses, here I am, he answered. Do not come closer, he said. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy ground. Friends, right out the gate, we see that God is holy. God is holy. Uh, This is a, a very intimate, personal encounter with God that Moses is having here. And God does this with us even today. It may not be in a a flame of fire within a burning bush, but it is in a personal, intimate way. God wants to engage us. He does. So here he transcends. He transcends to uh, Moses in this burning bush, entering into somewhat a face-to-face conversation with him. And he does all of this never negating his holiness. As Moses is drawn towards God's presence, he is told to stop. Do not come closer because the presence of God has made this place holy. This is who we are dealing with, friends. See, our our grasp of This image, this particular uh, scene here in the text is frequently distorted because of our failure to understand what the Bible means when it says holy. 
I mean, we do this all the time. When we, when we come to God, when we come to Jesus, we, we come in this buddy-buddy, it's all chilled, whatever kind of attitude. I believe it's because we don't fully understand what the Bible is saying when it says that God is holy. See, holiness came to describe the very nature of God. What makes God, God, or, 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 or who God is. See, many of the Old Testament prophets use holiness as a, as a synonym for God himself, like Isaiah does when he refers to God in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 3, when he says, the Holy One of Israel. Describes the nature of God. But also, the, the Hebrews came to realize that not only God was holy, but, but objects and people became holy because they had been set apart by God himself. That God had taken possession of them. And so when that happens, then, then that thing or those people are now considered holy. This speaks to the power of God's holiness. God is holy. And so holiness describes the, the otherness of God. The distinction between what makes him different from his creation. Taking off shoes would have been commonly understood in this particular context. You see, for, for us, maybe it's the removing of our hats. It's a, it's a sign of, of reverence. It's a sign of honor. This might uh, come to you as some uh, surprise, uh, pretty sure for many of you, but I am originally from Botswana. Any surprises? No? No? Maybe? Okay. So I am from Botswana, and, and in, in Botswana, when you walk into a government building, it's one of the things that I noticed that are different between Botswana and here. So when you walk into a government building and you are wearing a hat, you must take it off. As a sign of respect, as a sign of honor. Why? Because in government buildings, much like here, when you walk in, there's a picture of the president. And so what that is communicating is this, this man oversees all that we see. And so we take off as a sign of honor and a sign of respect. I believe that's what's happening here. There is a call on Moses' life to recognize where you are, in whose presence you are in. I also believe, together with other theologians and historians, who say that the, the removal of sandals here also speaks to one confessing of a personal violation. It's someone recognizing that they are unworthy to stand in the presence of holiness. It's God going, I want you to recognize that you are unworthy. Yes, show me respect, honor me, but also recognize that you are unholy. And so if, as we see here, Moses engaging with God, but it's the same for us. And so if we are going to have a conversation with God, if we're going to ask questions, even challenge, it's important that we know who we are and who he is. Friends, I, I don't mind if we show up with questions. We should. God is not afraid of our questions. He's not afraid of our doubt. But friends, we've got to recognize who we are in the story and who he is. He is holy. And so even though he wants to engage us, he wants us to have a personal relationship with him, recognize who he is. God is holy. But he continues in verse 6. Then he continued, this is God, saying to Moses, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at 
God. These are some of the themes that we picked up last week. The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. The God is a covenant God. And we see it in our chapters here today. Verse 15 of chapter 3 and verse 16. And then again in chapter 4, verse 5. This, this, this reminder that he is a God of covenant. Let's keep going. Verse 7, then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people in Egypt. and I have heard them crying out because of their oppressors. I know about their sufferings, and I have come down to rescue them. Notice, God has observed, he has heard, he knows, and now he comes down. This is an engaging God. It's not a God who sits back and goes, you know what, good luck. It's not a God who's disinterested in what you are going through. No, no, he observes, he hears, he knows, and then he comes. I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians and to bring them from that land to a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here's another place where I wish I had time. I wish I had time to unpack what this means. What does it mean to live in a a land that is spacious, that is flowing with milk and honey? Because this is what God wants for us. Now, some of us might go, oh, yeah, I get that, that one day, one day, when God comes to make all things new, when Jesus returns, one day I will will live in this land that, that is spacious, that is flowing with milk and honey, and I would say amen to that. But I also want you to know that God wants that for you today. Even in the chaos, even in the crisis, even in COVID. God wants you to experience, even if it's just a trailer attraction, even if it's just a taste of what is to come, He wants that for you. In all the areas of your life, your relationships, your marriage, your finances, your emotions. A land that is spacious, flowing, which means that it's alive. It's flowing with milk. Milk nourishes. So you are being nourished, that you are growing from health to health to health. And honey, that your marriage should be sweet. That when you think about the things that you do, they should be sweet. Your experiences should be sweet. I don't know where we get this this idea that the Christian life is this life of, oh, you know, it just sucks. I just can't wait. I've got my ticket. But, you know, it just sucks. Those are people who I believe have not fully entered into the presence and the goodness of who God is. The already, but not yet. I get the not yet. But friends, there is an already. (sighs) I wish I had time. He says, I I, I will take you to this land. Land flowing with milk and honey. The territory of all, I'm just going to summarize here, all the ites, right? I'm just going to call them the ites, right? All the ites. Verse 9, so because the Israelites cry for help, has come to me, and I have also seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. Therefore, go. I am sending you to Pharaoh so that you may lead my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. Now, I want us to take a closer look at Moses' response. It's important. God, in in some ways, has revealed himself. He's laid out the plan. Uh, Look at Moses' response. Verse 11. But Moses asked God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Now, I find it curious that many of us will cry out to God to show up in a powerful and profound way. To show up and to tell us what to do. To save us from our sin. Then when he does, all we have for him are questions and doubts. Think about that for a moment. 
Let's go back to last week. Uh, Moses became a fugitive because he, he, he recognized that his people were being oppressed. So he's like, man, I, I, they need to be delivered. This is not how they should live. And so he steps in. He wants deliverance from his people. And so maybe for, for 40 years now as a shepherd, every now and then he sits and he goes, I wonder about my people. I wonder what's happening back in Egypt. I wish they would be delivered. Maybe it started off as a loud prayer and became a silent one. I don't know. But God shows up. And he says, here's who I am and here's what we're going to do. And we go, well, hold on. Uh, I've got some questions. I've got got some doubt. He, He shows up and yet we question him. We are no different to Moses. Let's be careful not to judge too quickly. What are the areas in your life where God shows up and then all of a sudden you go, "Mm, God, I I wish I was part of a community that would love me and care for me and and call me out so that I could grow. And then God goes, hey, here's a community. Ah, God, this one. Are you sure? God says, I will bring them out of Egypt. Amen. I've heard their cry. Yes. I've seen the oppression. Oh, thankfully, I will send you. Uh, Say what now? Moses spent three years as an Egyptian prince. Then loses everything. So I can only imagine what he went through. The constant wrestle of identity. Somewhat Jewish, but also Hebrew. Wondering about his purpose. What, what have I been called to? Yeah, may, maybe deep down he knew that he, there was this purpose, this plan over his life to deliver his people. But he's like, I tried and it didn't work. So what does that mean? I believe now he's probably adjusting to his new normal. He's now slowly rebuilding his life. He's maybe come to terms with his failures as a deliverer, settling into a comfortable life of shepherding. And then God shows up and tells him to go back to where he came from. This is not an easy thing, friends. I want to bring you into the tension of the text. It's not an easy thing. But I say this because I also recognize that there are people in this room who probably are wrestling with the same thing. God, I thought. God, I tried. God, don't you remember? How can I go back? I'm pretty sure that God probably, or Moses probably feels, that God in some way is saying, go expose yourself to potential embarrassment, discomfort, and even attack. Maybe that's what he's feeling. Maybe that's what he's hearing. Friends, we all have a past. All of us. I don't know what your story is, but I know you have one. But hear this, in the hands of God, who redeems our past. Whatever has happened to us, should never keep us from what God wants to do in and through us. Because that's who God is. God is a redeeming God. He's a restoring God. He is a healing God. And so we see here in our text that in less than seven verses, Moses goes from here I am to who am I? In less than seven verses. Moses quite simply says, I don't think I can do this. In fact, I know I can't do this. That's what he's saying. And and at the core of what's happening here, I want to keep it real for you this morning. I believe at the core of what is happening here is, is not necessarily Moses questioning his own ability. It sounds like that on the surface. But I believe what's happening is that he's questioning God's wisdom in choosing him. 
Does this sound familiar? I can't do what God asks. I don't know how. I can't do what God asks because I'm not qualified. I can't obey because it's too hard. I can't obey. I won't obey. I've tried it before, etc., etc., etc. You're questioning God's wisdom. Because he says, no, hold on. Listen, I have a plan. I know what I'm doing. See, when we center our response to God on who we are and what we are capable of, this kind of logic will result in a life of faithless decisions, regret, and disobedience. Let me say that again. When we center our response to God on who we are and what we are capable of, This kind of logic will result in a life of faithless decisions, regret, and disobedience. If you only do what you want, what you feel, or what you see, or what you think you can do, you will live a life of comfort and success in the world's eyes, but a waste in the eyes of the kingdom of God. And we see this over and over and over, not just in Exodus, but throughout the scriptures. Yes, it's important for us to understand who we are, but we don't center that, 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 that reality. We, we, we don't do that in what God has called us to do. And I want us to notice as well that God doesn't say to Moses, yes, you can. He doesn't say, Moses, where is your self-confidence? Where is your self-belief? Don't you know that you can do anything you set your mind to? Come on, Moses. Pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. God doesn't say that. God says, yeah, you're right. It's not about you. It's not about you, big boy. Of course, on your own, you can't do this. But hear this. You're not going anywhere that I'm not going. That's what God is saying here. He says, I will be with you. Uh, Look with me in verse 12. He answered, I will certainly. There it is again. I will certainly be with you. And this will be the sign to you that I am the one who sent you. When you bring the people out of Egypt you will all worship God at this mountain. The one that you've been coming to. Maybe every day, maybe uh, uh, twice a week, but you come here regularly, you will worship me here. Then Moses asked God, if I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What should I tell them? Now this is a big question. Right? This is massive. What Moses is asking here is no small thing. Not forgetting, Moses at this point is a shepherd, no longer a prince, but now a fugitive. I don't want us to forget that. He's going to a place of idolatry and oppression. That's where he's going. The center of idolatry and oppression at that time. And so Moses is asking for more information. He's like, listen, God, I'm a fugitive. This is Egypt. Give me some evidence. Give me some credentials. Give me something. And so in verse 14, God replied to Moses, I am who I am. Now, we're going to unpack that, but let me be honest. Guys, I would be absolutely frustrated. Absolutely frustrated. I'd be like, okay, Who am I going to say? And it's, I am who I am. It's like, God, I don't want to be disrespectful, but I am who I am. Uh, I am who I am is basically a repeated Hebrew verb meaning to be. Other translations, if you have one in front of you, it might say, I will 
be what I will be. Or I will be who I am. Or I am who I will be. In many ways, this declaration distinguishes God from all of humankind. From all the unpredictable and unreliable false gods of Egypt. And all the false gods of our day. I am who I am. In essence, God says, I am. I am is consistent. I am is dependent on no one. I am is unchanging. I can be counted on to be God because I am. That's what he's saying. I am, full stop. Read the text with me. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the Israelites. The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. This is how I am to be remembered in every generation. I am. Now, much has been written regarding what I have just read. There's tons that's been Written in fact, I spent many hours trying to unpack all of this. The, in a sense, the revealing of God's name. And we can most definitely dive deeper into all of it. And, and maybe we will at some point. Maybe this is one of the conversations that we'll have uh, in our Q&A video. But for now, let me say this. In hopes that it will answer some questions on this matter. And if not, then maybe uh, settle you a little bit until we do have time to unpack more on this name. Let me say this, that in ancient Hebrew, vowels were not written down. So the name was recorded as Y-H-W-H. And then in the Greek version of the Old Testament, the the divine name was transcribed and the vowels A and E were inserted, giving the name Yahweh. And so although this was done centuries after Moses, it is the earliest evidence that we have as to what the actual vowels were. Were. That's, that if you dive a little bit deeper into this, this name, I am, these are some of the things that you will unpack. But I think what's important for this morning is to let you know that this name, Yahweh, was not a new name. Nor was it an unknown name. In fact, it appears about a hundred times in the book of Genesis. Moses and the Israelites knew the name Yahweh. God did not give Moses a new and improved name. That's not what's happening here. He was giving him a name that they knew. In fact, God was calling them back to the faith of their forefathers, not to something new. Telling us that that he is a God of covenant. Like I said, we can probably unpack this more a little bit later. What I want you to see here now is that God is saying to Moses that this is who you are to say sent you. The same God who has been faithful throughout the ages. That's who sent you. A faithful God who has been faithful throughout the ages and will continue to be faithful. You can trust in me. And here are a few things that I believe God is saying by making this declaration. It's a personal declaration of his name. It's a personal declaration of his name. That's what's happening here. Uh, Watch this. God names himself. No one else does. Don't miss that. We were all named by someone. All of us. I'm sure maybe some of you changed it. You went to home affairs because you didn't like it, so you changed it. That's cool. But at the beginning of your life, you were named by someone else. God here says, no, no one names me. I name myself. God defines and declares who God is. But more importantly, God gives humanity a name to call him by. That's what's happening. He's he's like, listen, I know who I am, but now I'm giving you a name that you can call me by. In a very real sense, God shares a part of himself with humanity. This is the first time God has revealed his name 
this way, this, this giving of himself. It's the first time that he does so, but it's not the last time that he unpacks more of who he is. In fact, with each step of the journey throughout Exodus, we learn more and more about God, more about the name. See, after Israel's deliverance, God reveals more about his name to Moses. When Moses asks, would you just show me your glory? He says, okay, Exodus 34, verses 5 to 7. And then the Lord came down in a cloud and stood there with him. And he called out his own name, Yahweh. The Lord passed in front of Moses, calling out, Yahweh the Lord, the God of compassion and mercy. I am slow to anger and filled with unfailing love and faithfulness. I will lavish unfailing love to a thousand generations. I forgive iniquity, rebellion, and sin. That's who I am. All of that is wrapped up in my name. But I'm not done. But I do not excuse the guilty. Why? Because God is holy. I lay the sins of the parents upon their children and grandchildren. The entire family is affected. Even children in the third and fourth generations. This is not part of my notes, but hear me. Friends, your sin is contagious. See, for so many of us, we go, you know what? No, it's, it's the sin. It's just me. It has no impact on anyone else. It's just me. That's not what the text says. So what happens after this? After God says to Moses, tell them I am sent you. Well, Moses continues to protest, right? Exodus chapter 4, verse 1, Moses answered, What if they won't believe me and will not obey me, but say, The Lord did not appear to you? So God says, Okay, um, then I'll give you some signs, right? I'll give you some signs and wonders to accompany my words. Does any of this sound familiar? you were with us during uh, the series of Mark, you would remember Mark 16, Jesus sends us out with his word and they'll be accompanied with signs and wonders. Gosh, I love the Bible. And so he says to Moses, I'll give you some signs and wonders if they don't believe you. Sign number one, he says, what's in your hand? A staff, throw it on the ground and it'll turn into a snake. Stretch out your hand, grab the snake by the tail and it'll turn back into a staff. We find this in verses two to five of chapter four. Then he gives them another sign. Put your hand in your cloak. When it comes out, it will be uh, deceased. The text says, resembling snow. Put it back in your cloak. Take it out again and it'll come back normal. Verses six, um, we see this in verses six of chapter four. And still, if they don't believe, if they still don't listen to you, he gives them a third sign. He says, take water from the Nile and pour it on the dry ground. The water you take from the Nile will become blood on the ground. Verses 8 and 9 of chapter 4. He gives them these three signs. And these signs, we're told, were for the elders of Israel. We see this in verses uh, 16 and 18. They're given to Moses. If the elders do not believe. But what I find interesting is that uh, these signs would later uh, be amplified against Pharaoh and the Egyptians. Right? So, so, so there were a, a lot of things that happened, right? and we'll pick up uh, on this later. Uh, but, but these three signs that we see here, they are later amplified to Pharaoh. It's not just some water from the Nile spilt on the ground that turns to blood. It's the whole Nile River that turns to blood. It's not just a diseased hand. It's boils that cover the whole body, that cover the entire nation. It's not just a staff that changes uh, to a snake and then back to a staff again. It's a snake that eats all other snakes. I found that interesting. Uh, Not going anywhere with it. Back to Moses and the signs. So God gives him these signs, but still Moses protests. Verse 10, but Moses replied to the Lord, please, Lord, I have never been eloquent, either in the past or recently or since you have been speaking to your servant, because my mouth and my tongue are sluggish. I love God's response to that. Watch this, verse 11. The Lord said to him, who placed a mouth on humans? 
Who makes a person mute or deaf, seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I will help you speak and I will teach you what to say. Let me translate. Who said I need your mouth? Actually, who gives humans mouths? Who gives humans anything? Some of us here are walking around thinking, you know what, it's my intellect, it's my resources, it's my abilities. And while I get what you're saying, be careful that your heart is not saying, I am the master of my own destiny. Who gave you those things? The fact that your heart continues to beat right now is because God allows it. So God says that to Moses, and guess what? Still, Moses protests against God. Verse 13, Moses said, please, Lord, send someone else. You know what? Just send someone else. We are then told that God's anger burns against Moses. But remember, God is slow to anger. He is merciful. And so he then says to Moses, take your brother, Aaron. No, I'm joking. It doesn't say that. It says Aaron. Uh, take Aaron because he knows how to speak. He'll speak for the both of you. Now, now a little side note here. Uh, while Aaron proved to be helpful, he was a bit of a headache. He was. It's the same Aaron who... who instigated the worship of a golden calf. In fact, he shaped it himself, which led to the Israelites worshiping this idol instead of worshiping God. We're told that Aaron's sons blasphemed and dishonored God with unclean offerings. Now, you might go, but those were his children. Yeah, I know, but... uh, you all know this. Uh, when kids are wiling out uh, somewhere, yeah, we'll look to the kids, but we'll, in reality, we're actually looking to the parents. Right? Where's so and so's parents? This is the same Aaron who at one time openly led a rebellion against Moses. Same Aaron. Exodus 4, verse 18. Then Moses went back to his father-in-law. He's like, okay, cool. God, I'll go. I'll take my brother. I'll go. So he goes back to his father-in-law, Jethro, and said to him, please let me return to my relatives in Egypt and see if they are still living. I I love that. He doesn't tell him what happened. No. Jethro, I just had an encounter with God. It was epic. I said no a bunch of times. He wasn't having it. No, he's just, "I, I need to go back to Egypt to check on my relatives. And then I love Jethro's response. Go in peace. Now, I don't know if there was beef between the two of them. I don't know. Maybe Jethro was just a wise guy, right? We'll see this in Exodus 18. But go in peace. Love that. And so they go. They go. And from there, we pick up uh, the story of Moses and Aaron now uh, engaging with Pharaoh. But Before we get there, I'd like to point out something interesting that happens in verses 24 to 26 of Exodus chapter 4. And in many ways, I believe it sets up the theme of obedience in a very powerful way. All right? Let me read it. Verse 24. It says, On the trip at an overnight campsite, it happened that the Lord confronted him and intended to put him to death. So now Moses is with his wife Zipporah and his children, and they're now heading to Egypt, right? So this is where this is happening now, the campsite, overnight campsite, uh, an Airbnb. Verse 25, so Zipporah took a flint, cut off her son's foreskin, threw it at Moses' feet, and said, you are the bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone, and at that time she said, you are a bridegroom of blood, referring to the circumcision. How random is that? Right, in this epic narrative and and God's laying out the plan and engaging with Moses and Moses goes, okay, cool, I'm going to go. We have verses 24 to 26 and we're going, what on earth is going on here? Let me give some context. Now, there's much debate about who the him in the text is. Tons of debate. Some would say the him is Gershom, which is Moses' son. Others will say it's Moses. I believe that the him is 
Moses. I believe that because of the context of what's going on here. Which begs the question, how did Moses go from being God's tool for delivering the Israelites to now being God's adversary worthy worthy of death? Like, what happened? For what possible reason would God have for attacking Moses? His whole plan of Israel's salvation required Moses, did it not? Moses was the one who was called to lead God's people out of Egypt. Moses was the one who would gather the elders and perform the miracles and to demand the release of God's firstborn son. So what on earth is going on? Well, like I said, it's necessary for us to read the verses before. And so let me do so. Uh, Exodus 4 verses 21. It says, The Lord instructed Moses, When you go back to Egypt, make sure you do before Pharaoh all the wonders that I've put within your power. But I will harden his heart so that he won't let the people go. Here's another massive question here. God is hardening hearts? I'm going to do it. So look, about 14 times in Exodus, we hear about the hard heart of Pharaoh, right? About 14 times. Of those 14, 10 of them is where Pharaoh hardens his own heart. It's important to know. Gosh, let me read it. Y'all are killing me with time. Exodus chapter 5. That's what happens when you have really big fingers. Exodus chapter 5. This is Moses and Aaron, Aaron's engagement with Pharaoh. It says, Later Moses and Aaron went in and said to Pharaoh, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. Let my people go so that they may hold a festival for me in the wilderness. Verse 2, but Pharaoh responded, Who is the Lord that I should obey him by letting Israel go? Who is this God of yours? I don't know the Lord. And besides, even if I did, I will not let Israel go. I don't care who he is. I don't believe in him. And even if I did, We've just spoken about God being holy. No one, no one, no one says that to God and gets away with it. Why? Because God cannot go against his glory. He just cannot. He is a God clothed in immense glory. And there is no reason, no reason that he would go, you know, it's totally fine. I'll just leave it. Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And after doing this over and over and over and over again, the text tells us that God just said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just give you up to what it is that you want. You want to do your own thing? Go for it. And that is where we pick up that God then hardens Pharaoh's heart, but he does so as a sign and as a warning. We see this in Romans. He does this as a sign and as a warning so that we today might look upon that and go, you know what? God is gracious. God is slow to anger. He is loving and merciful. But guys, let's not play with God. Verse 22. And you will say to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord says. Israel is my first born son. I told you, let my son go so that he may worship me, but you refuse to let him go. Look, I'm about to kill your firstborn son. All this talk about firstborn son, father and son, father and son. There's this theme of sonship that is so beautiful in the book of Exodus, but it's beautiful in the scriptures. And so if we look at the text carefully, I believe that we can make the conclusion that that God was angered at Moses because he had not circumcised his son. There is a circumcision that takes place here and Moses had not circumcised his son, which is a clear violation of one of God's commandments, a covenantal one at that, that speaks of father and son. He he says, this is how you will know that you are mine, that you belong to me. I will give you the sign of circumcision. It is a covenant sign. And Moses hadn't circumcised his son. Perhaps Moses' Egyptian upbringing had, had him not take circumcision as a big deal. Maybe that's one of the reasons. There's so many theories to why Moses had not done this. Whatever the reason, we see in the text the obedience and the faithfulness of an African woman step in. Zipporah. Now some of you are going, oh, 
Kwame, how do you know she's African? I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you asked. Remember the rebellion that I mentioned that Aaron led against Moses? He did this together with his sister. We see this in Numbers chapter 12. Uh, let, let me read it to you. Miriam and Aaron criticized Moses because of the Cushite woman he had married. So it wasn't just the fact that, like, who is this Moses that we should listen to him? Oh, by the way, why would you marry this Cushite woman? Now, some translations will say Ethiopian woman. See, the word Cush itself means black, and historically the people of Cush uh, were dark-skinned people. The land of Cush is associated in Scripture with several areas in the ancient world, but its most common link is in the land of Ethiopia. Little nugget for you. Uh, in a couple of weeks, uh, Lord willing, uh, we're going to have a pastor, a man who uh, our church is now becoming a really good friend with, who will come and unpack. I mean, just so many beautiful nuggets about what God is doing in the Ethiopian context and how Africa fits in the grand narrative of our faith. Guys, I, I am so, you cannot believe how excited I am. But here in the text, we see the faithfulness of an African woman step in. Zipporah was a dark-skinned, sun-kissed African woman, and there is evidence biblically to point to this. The faithfulness of an African woman acting courageously and decisively, possibly because Moses himself maybe was too close to death to respond, so Zipporah steps in, cuts her son's foreskin, touches it to Moses, and then says, you are the bridegroom of blood to me. I don't know if she realized that what she was uttering was so prophetic. Who is Jesus to the church? The bridegroom. How is that possible? By the blood. What saved Moses' life was circumcision of his son. Now, why is this such a big deal? Well, like I said, circumcision was covenantal. And God does not go against his covenants. He doesn't. No matter who you are. And so, yes, he's called Moses to go and do this amazing thing. But he goes, hey, listen, I'm still a God of covenant. I don't care who you are. Obedience matters to me. It matters. And so if Moses was going to serve the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, he had to have a covenant obligation to circumcise his sons. He had to. But more on this later when we talk about the Passover. I love that. I, oh, I love it. I love it. Ladies, listen to me. Your faithfulness, your faithfulness has massive implications for what happens in our lives today. You matter. You matter. Chapter 4 of Exodus ends with Moses being reunited with Aaron. And then they go to the elders of, of uh, the Israelites and they do as God said. Uh, and then we're told that the Israelites believed and worshipped God. And then chapter 5, uh, Moses and Aaron then confront Pharaoh. And we'll talk about that in the weeks to come. But before we go there um, and before we wrap up, uh, I want us to see who the hero of the story is here. Because I think that's the grand theme in our text today. Yes, there's a lot happening here, and literally we could unpack it. We could spend hours just unpacking a lot of what I've said, but I want you to see who the hero is in the story. And let me give you a clue. It's not Moses. How many times does God say I in chapters 3 and 4? I counted. And according to my translation, I found 18. 18 eyes. This is God speaking of himself, where he says, oh, I know this, or I will do this. I, 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 I. Let, let's look at the plan, and I'll, I'll read it quickly. Exodus uh, 3, verse 16 to 20. This is the plan that, that Moses is now going to put into action. It says, go and assemble the elders of Israel and say to them, the Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has appeared to me and said, I have paid close attention to you and to what has been done to you in Egypt. And I have promised you that I will bring you up from the misery of Egypt to the land of all the ites. Verse 18, they will listen to what you say. Then you, along with the elders of Israel, must go to the king of Egypt and say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, has met with us. Now please let us go on a three-day trip into the wilderness so that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Verse 19, however... I know that the king of Egypt will not allow you to go, even under force from a strong hand. But when I stretch out 
my hand and strike Egypt with all my miracles that I will perform in it. After that, he will let you go. And I will give these people such favor with the Egyptians that when you go, you will not go empty-handed. And he wraps it up. Where again, he talks about these amazing women. Each woman will ask her neighbor and any woman staying in her house for silver and gold, jewelry and clothing, and you will put them on your sons and daughters so you will plunder the Egyptians. Friends, in all of this, what we are seeing, what we are seeing is that God provides that which he requires. God provides that which he requires. This is not just a theme in Exodus. This is the story of the Bible. Whether it's with Abraham and Isaac when they go up for the sacrifice, God provides the ram. Or Moses in Exodus. Or humanity and salvation. God provides what he requires. This is why he gave us Jesus. Because we could not give what God required of us. We fail over and over and over and over again. And so what does God do? God says, okay, fine. Then I will provide that which I require. I require obedience, faithfulness. And so therefore, our role is then to be obedient. That's what our role is in all of this, is to be obedient. If God is going to provide everything, then what are we to do? To be obedient. To be obedient so that we can see and experience that God always provides what he requires. And that he does so every time. So my question to you this morning is, will you be obedient? Will you be obedient? The question is, how will you respond to God? Will you recognize that he is holy? Will you rest in his provision? Will you rest in Jesus? That's the question today. That's what we see in Exodus chapter 3 and 4. It's this question that says, will you be obedient so that you can see that God provides that which he requires? Will you rest in Jesus? Because there can be no freedom without it. There can be no freedom without it. We'll see as we make our way through Uh, Exodus, there's no freedom. If you do not obey, whether it's the Passover, whether it's those walking through the Red Sea being parted, whether it's making it in the desert all the way to the promised land, if you are not obedient, you will not find the freedom that is found in God. And that obedience allows us to see God's provision. It's not just for the Israelites in Exodus, friends. But that question is to be answered here today. Will you be obedient? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. There's so much in it. Uh, but Father, I pray now that that we would be still enough with all that's happening in our lives, that so many things coming at us, that that, that we would be still in your presence, that we we would just pause for a moment so that we might reflect and answer this question honestly. Do we obey you? Does that obedience lead to trust? Or are we filled with anxiety and worry are we so overwhelmed by all that's happening around us that, that we now center ourselves and try to become the heroes of the story when in reality there is only one hero and he is seated on his throne fully in control aware of every situation the text has told us that, that God you have observed you have seen you have heard you know, and you have come down. And so God, we thank you for Jesus who came and lived the life that we could not live, died the death that we all deserved, and provided what we could not provide. You are the God of our salvation. Help us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.